Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes and today we have the biggest complete nightmare repair we've had so far on the channel. You might have spotted this is a 20 minute video, that's because there's a lot of stuff to do, we're going to learn a lot, we're going to replace a lot, we're going to repair a lot and we're going to get it ultimately up and running. As we always say, no specky left behind. So this board has obviously had quite a history, starting by looking at the lower RAM. Somebody has replaced quite a lot of them and tried to start removing the chip here in the middle and got bored and given up. You can see it's a bit of a mess, there's open joints, things are burned and I'm sure we're going to find some damage to the traces. I also spotted this fairly major short which shorts the negative leg of C44 to pin 8 of the upper RAM and they both happen to be ground so this wouldn't cause a problem but it does mean we need to check the rest of the board very carefully. TR4 and TR5 have been replaced at some point, although I can't see any shorts there, so as long as they're working that shouldn't be a problem. And the coil has been removed, um, no damage on the underside, but as we'll see there is some damage on the top side. Also spotted this leg, presumably a capacitor leg, nestling inside the speaker there, so we'll remove that. Here we can see that all but one of the lower RAM chips have been socketed and some of them seem to have been replaced. Now, have you spotted it yet? C6 is missing, and there's something else fairly major there. Have you spotted it? We'll have a closer look in a minute. Another small concern is that these capacitors that have been used to do the recap are radial, and the lower leg could be shorting to the board because there's no heat shrink or insulation on them. I'm going to replace them all with um, axial capacitors anyway. A composite video mod has been done, although it looks like the board's been burned a little bit so we'll need to inspect that. Also there's no insulation on the hole there on the side of the modulator case so that leg is shorting to ground which means it's not going to work. If you spotted this earlier well done, fairly major foul. This beefy minus 5 volt supply to the lower RAM has been ripped up. So I think I'm going to take all those sockets out. Another thing which is directing me to totally stripping the board is I can see daylight through some of these joints on the capacitors, so they're all going to have to come out. They'll come out anyway because I'm going to put the axial caps on, as I've already mentioned. Unfortunately, the speaker's been burned a little bit, but if it still works, I'm not going to replace it. I don't think it's worth replacing just for that. We're going to get the microscope out and have a closer look at what we're dealing with in a minute. Another thing of interest I noticed is the modulator box is totally empty, which might explain why the hole on the left wasn't insulated, We'll just redo the composite mod with some heat shrink on the capacitor leg. Okay, let's get these chips out, the RAM chips and the ULA chip. They can come out quickly because they're socketed. As promised, now it's time to have a look under the microscope. Here's our short from the capacitor to the upper RAM, actually short and ground to ground, so it would still work, still going to tidy it up. This is the minus 5 volt rail which has been torn up. I'm going to try and solder them back together rather than patching it. Here is our missing decoupling capacitor, C6, and moving over to the right, C8 is showing evidence that somebody's been prying the RAM chips out, which doesn't bode well for the pads and traces underneath those sockets. So let's get cracking, remove all of these capacitors. They are new, so I'm not going to cut them out, so there's no point in wasting them. I do find this job's easier to do with the board in a vise. Just be super careful not to over tighten the vise, obviously. All right, with that done, we can get the microscope back out and inspect some of the top side of the board. Here's the damage I mentioned earlier on the coil. We've lost some of that pad, although that should solder in, I think it shouldn't be a problem. TR4 and TR5, as I mentioned, have been replaced. Um, There's a bit too much solder on some of these legs and a bit too little on some others, but they seem to be attached. Here's an issue. Uh, We've lost a pad where this capacitor joins and connects to the traces underneath the ULA. So I'll patch that just to be sure. We've fixed the short here between C44 and the upper ramp. Not that it was causing a problem, it's nice that it looks neater now. Here's where the last RAM chip had started to be removed. You can see there's quite a lot of burning, some damage to the pads. Um, It's going to need removing. I'm going to remove all of those lower RAM chips and sockets and have a good look after cleaning it and see exactly what needs patching up. This is where the composite video mod has been done. We'll need to remove that. You can see that the trace is actually lifted from the board, so we'll need to be super careful in removing that. Fast forward a little bit. Here it is after I remove the capacitor, and the connection is still there, although the trace is lifted. Once soldered in, though, I don't think we should have a problem. Also spotted this damaged trace on the right-hand side. 
This happens sometimes if people hold the board in alligator clips, I've seen this before, but this is quite an easy one to fix, we can see very easily um, what connection has been lost, so let's fix that now real quick. The joint on the left is covered in a solder mask, so we're going to need to scrape that away. I'm just going to use a scalpel and just carefully scrape away at it until some nice shiny metal is exposed. That should do the trick. Next I'm going to flood the joints with solder so I can then poke in the patch wire. At least that's the theory. You'll see this gets quite fiddly and quite annoying with melting wires, um, as we'll see a lot of when we come to repair the lower ram. I'm going to use solid core insulated wire. The insulation is what tends to melt, um, as you'll see, but as long as we're quick and careful, it goes in quite nicely like that. Now for the other side, this is a bit smaller, a bit more fiddly, but all we need to do is melt the solder, make sure the wires get hot, and it will stick in there. As you can see, my soldering iron has um, sucked up the solder that I flooded the joint with, so now I'm going to need to add a little bit extra, and that's not looking too bad. You can see that the rubber has, or the plastic, has started to melt there, you need to be careful with that because that can um, introduce shorts that you don't want. Anyway, that's looking fairly neat, I'm happy with that. Alright, we're making progress. So, when I removed all of those capacitors, I haven't cleared the joints yet, so let's whiz around the board, cleaning up, um, clearing up those joints for a recap um, before we start to look at the lower RAM situation. This is going to take a little while, there's 8 chips each with 16 legs to remove, so that is 128 joints to desolder. I'm going to do it carefully and non-destructively because I've got a feeling it's going to be quite delicate under there. Those traces have had a hard time. And I was right, it did take a little while. Um, a lot of those pads were kind of a bit squashed and half torn up which made it difficult to free the legs up. But as you can see we got there and as you can also see there's a lot of pads missing, there's a lot of traces all over the shop. There's going to be a bit of tidying up to do before we can start replacing any of those components. Plan of attack then is to clean it up with the old toothbrush and some alcoholic spirit. That will allow us to really see what we're working with. Then we're going to take a look at all of those traces that are damaged or partially damaged and see which ones are still connected, which ones are hanging loose, which are totally missing and any that are hanging loose we're going to trim them with the wire snippers. With that done we'll use the multimeter to check the continuity across the lower arm and make a note of every connection which is damaged and needs patching. Ultimately you want to check every possible uh, test for continuity from left to right between all of the pins. All the corresponding pins should have continuity apart from the data in and data out pins. Eventually I came up with this diagram showing me all of the patches that need to happen. That's quite a lot but at least we know what needs to be done now. Next up I wanted to check that missing pad on the top side where the capacitor has been removed next to the ULA. I really want to make sure to patch this up correctly, so I'm referring to the schematic. I tested continuity from the positive leg of C28 to everything that it connects to. Everything did check out, but I'm still going to put a patch wire in just to be sure, because the two traces that lead up to this missing pad were incredibly thin. So just to be sure, I'll add an extra patch there. Now what about that big thick trace which has been ripped up, the minus 5 volt supply to the lower RAM? I won't lie, this is a bit off script for me, but my plan is to tin the leg of the socket to which it's going to connect. I'll then flatten down the broken traces, both sides of it, so they're up against the leg there, and the leg can act as a bridge. I'll put a load of solder on there and hopefully connect everything up. Then it would just be a case of heating the new joint while pushing down on the socket to get it as flush as possible to the board. So at this point the two broken traces are connected via the leg of the socket. I'm just going to put some heat on now while pushing down and make it flush. I don't think that's too bad and once we've repaired the underside of the board we should have a good connection. With that done and armed with our diagram of all the patches we need to make it's time to solder in sockets across the entire lower ram. In order to tackle these missing pads I'm going to use donor pads, drop them over the top like that and although they're not connected to the PCB they're going to create something that looks a hell of a lot more like a solder joint and will be a lot easier to work with with the patch wires. 
You'll see in this very honest bit of video that this is pretty fiddly stuff. The pad got stuck to my soldering iron um, and I sort of managed to poke it back on there. Had another crack at soldering it and it got stuck to the solder. Uh, another crack and eventually started to get the knack of dragging things away in such a way that the pad stayed put and made a good connection. This is the result of all the fiddly patchwork. Uh, we got there in the end, all the continuity checks out, there's no shorts, although I did get through a lot of bits of wire because it kept melting. With that done, and um, also the coil was replaced while I was doing that, I wanted to do a quick check of the resistances from the power supplies to the lower ramp to ground. Hopefully they weren't too small, which they weren't, which means I could plug in and start checking voltages. Remember that we're looking for plus 5, minus 5 and plus 12. There's our minus 5, there's our 12, and there's our plus 5. That's quite surprising actually, but good news. I will test the lower RAM chips that I pulled out, but I'm going to put all new ones in for now, just so we know that the lower RAM wouldn't be the problem. I, mean, I am expecting to see some issues when we power this up. Before powering up though, I do want to do the composite mod again, so we can see what video output we're getting. Going to be careful of this um, bare metal case, so we're going to put some heat shrink on the leg of the capacitor. This is just a simple job of popping some heat shrink around the leg, holding it with some tweezers and warming it up with a lighter. Having done that without setting anything on fire, it's time to fit it to the bod. We'll attach the negative leg to the jack here and the positive leg to that damaged trace on the PCB. You might have noticed at some point along the way the capacitor fairy's been along and replaced the caps with these nice new blue ones. I should also mention that the ULA was dead, so I'm using a spare here. Unfortunately, it didn't boot properly, so what I'm doing here is I'm probing the address lines on the Z80 and this one I found was way too low. In amplitude, we should be seeing a nice square wave with 5 volt amplitude. I'm hedging my bets that the Z80 is causing this as opposed to the ROM because we had a white border, so I'm going to start by replacing that. And I'm going to drink some Brewdog Punk Alcohol Free while I'm doing it because it's really nice. I'm not sponsored by the way, but if Brewdog do want to sponsor me, I'll be very open to that. Alright, fast forward and as if by magic, I'm just going to pull the Z80 right out of its place with my bare hands. Now we can solder in a 40 pin socket and stick in a brand new Z80. And hooray, it boots! Isn't that a sight to behold? Happy with that. Uh, the next job to do is to replace the voltage regulator with a switching one. The owner would like me to do that. But first I need to hypnotise my cat so she will stop bothering me. Okay, that was a lot of work, but we got there in the end. And this is where I would normally be celebrating and wrapping up and playing some games. But during the soak test, we started getting a failure of the upper RAM random test. And only after about 50 or 60 iterations. That's why it's so important to always run a soak test before you uh, sew up a job like this. Unfortunately, the nature of the test means we don't know which bit is failing. So we don't know which RAM chip to replace. So my plan of attack is to replace the top four upper RAM chips. That gives me a 50% chance of finding the broken one. Um, for that I'm going to need another beer, and here we go. Well I said it was 50-50 and we got the exact same failure mode again, so the bad RAM chip must be in those lower 4 chips of the upper RAM. But first maybe we should try and understand the failure mode here. What we normally do with the RAM test is we write values to each address in the RAM, and then read it back and check that it's the same. This test fills the entire RAM with a random pattern of bits and then reads back the entire upper RAM and checks that it matches what is expected. Failure here can mean that writing one bit is actually setting another bit in the RAM and your normal RAM test wouldn't capture this. So let's take a look up close at a RAM chip to try and take a good example of how this might happen. This is actually a 4116 chip, it's not the RAM that's failing but by way of example it serves quite well. So this chip contains a 128 by 128 array of memory locations that can be written to and read from, which gives you your 16 kilobits of storage capacity. By the way, thanks to Ken Shiriff for allowing me to use these images. Check out his blog via the link in the description. Now what happens when we want to write data to memory? Let's follow along with the datasheet. This timing diagram is quite useful. 
For the first part of the operation we're interested in the address bits 0 to 6 and the row address strobe which is called RAS or RAS. So what's going to happen initially is we're going to set RAS to high. Incidentally CAS or column address strobe will also be set to high at this point. And then we set the address bits to our row address. This address is decoded by the row decode circuitry on the right hand side of the matrix highlighted here. And then the RAS line is set to low, which is active, so that locks in the row that we've selected. Let's just say for the sake of example, it's somewhere where this red line is. So far so good, now we can move on to the column address. As we mentioned before, the column address strobe is high, it'll stay high while we change the address bits to the column address. The column address goes to the column decode circuitry, which is in the middle of the matrix there. And then we set CAS to low, which is active, which should lock in the column that we're interested in. You might think that that would just lock in the one column and we'd know what we were looking at, but in fact it locks in two columns wide and also two columns on the other half of the matrix, so that's four lines that are active. So if we look at the intersection between the row and the address, we can see that two bits are actually selected, and the selection between these two bits is made using the A6 line later on in the process. And if there was an issue with this last stage of the process, you can see how setting one bit could actually set another bit in the memory, and this upper RAM random fill test is the test that captures that. Anyway, let's get these last four chips out. By the way, if I said anything stupid in that previous explanation of the failure, please comment below. It's new ground for me, that. Alright, that's those chips out. And who remembers this trick where you touch your soldering iron to each of the pads to clean up the little spikes of solder that are left in there? and make your sockets drop in easily. Now hopefully the last bit of soldering on this job because uh, I don't see why it should still be failing after we replace these chips. I'm going to run the test with all new chips in there but then I'm going to do a process of elimination to try and figure out which is the dead one or the dead, which are the dead ones. I'm using the Dandonator which has a built in diagnostic ROM, still uh, using Brendan's diagnostic ROM and as you can see we got well over 200 soak tests so I'm pretty happy that we've fixed the machine now. All that's left to do is give it a play test, and I think we're finished. I think we'll go with Jet Set Willy, and I must say, the image is really good on this machine, considering everything it's been through. There's not much dot crawl, it looks really good. Anyway, thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.